This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 245, recorded on August 8th, 2013. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello and you are listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. I have a very special episode for you today. I'm in Princeton, New Jersey at a conference center and I am sitting at a table surrounded by my virology colleagues who have co-authored a textbook on virology called Principles of Virology. And I thought we'd get them all together here today and talk about how this works for everyone to learn about. So let me introduce everyone. I'll go around the table. Uh, from the Fox Chase Cancer Center, Ann Skalka. Hello. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> from Also from the Fox Chase Cancer Center, Glenn Rawl. Hey, Vincent. Glenn has been on TWIV before. I have indeed. This is my second episode with you, so. Thanks for doing this. Uh, from Princeton University, Lynn Enquist. Hi, Vince. Also return. Return. Right. Thanks for doing this. And from Princeton University, Jane Flint. Hello, Vince. Thank you for doing this as well. So I thought we would talk about different aspects of our textbook. But I want to start out by finding out <coughs> where each of you have been to reach uh, where you are today, where you're from and where your education is and so forth. Let's start with you, Anne. Are you from the Northeast? Yes, I'm from the Northeast. I was born and lived almost all my life in New York City. Wow, I didn't know that. You didn't know that. Was it, where did you live in Manhattan? Uh, I was born in Brooklyn. And uh, then I went to uh, Adelphi College on Long Island. Mm -hmm. And then Yale University for a little while. But my degree is from New York City, from NYU. I didn't know this. The yeah, our school. first paper is on snakes. Ah, my first paper is on snakes, yes. Seriously? I was, yes, as an undergraduate, <laughs> I was very interested in herpetology. That's great. I have several papers on snakes yes. and turtles, fossil turtles. Huh, I have to look those up. They're um, probably not on PubMed, though, right? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so your PhD was at NYU? My PhD was at NYU Medical School, yes. With whom? Jerry Hurwitz. Of course. Who's now yes. at Einstein, right? Who's now at Einstein, yes. Yes. So you must have done DNA replication, I would guess. That's right. And so I switched from herpetology mm -hmm. to biochemistry, molecular biology, the first time I made a DNA prep. It was such <laughs> cool stuff. The old-fashioned way. The old-fashioned yeah. way, yes. Swirling it out. Yes, yeah. exactly. <clears throat> and then uh, your postdoc? Oh, I, I was uh, four or five years at Cold Spring Harbor. Laboratories. Uh, my postdoc was with Al Hershey. Yes. Al Hershey. Al Why did Hershey. I think it was Al Campbell? No, Al, Al Hershey. Al Hershey, really? Yes, yes. I studied Lambda, but with Al Hershey. We were interested in that time about um, structures of viral genomes. Mm -hmm. And we were just beginning to study um, Lambda virus, which had these sticky ends that used to stick together and make circles. And so I was there for five years. And then I took my first independent job at the Roche Institute of Molecular Biology in New Jersey. And I was there 18 years. And finally, I ended up at Fox Chase. I don't know if you remember, but I met you at the Roche, actually. I was interviewing for a postdoc with Aaron Shatkin. That's right. Yes, he and was right down the hall from me. You came to my seminar, actually. Yes. Oh, right. good. A long time <laughs> Did ago. I ask good questions? I don't remember. That I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, but I do remember that. So, you know, they say uh, well, many good scientists come from Brooklyn. That must be true. I, I can't tell you how many times I've introduced speakers and they're from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I think Max Gottesman is from Brooklyn. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, a lot of them. Lucy Shapiro, Jerry Hurwitz. The whole, it was a whole group of, went to, uh, to finally ended up in the Bronx uh, uh, school of Science. There were a hmm. bunch of them, yeah. So Lucy Shapiro was my chair for a while at Columbia. Yes. So that's one of our connections. And then um, we were at, we were graduate students together. Did you know that? No. At yes. NYU. Yes. I yes. didn't know that. 
Yes, well, then we move to Einstein. What do they say about science? There's no more than three degrees of separation right? <laughs> between different scientists, right? Now, Glenn, you probably did this last time you were on, but I don't remember any of it. So tell me again where you're from. You're from New Jersey, right? Right. Well, I usually say I grew up outside of New York City because that sounds cooler than saying <laughs> I'm from New Jersey. But um, Right, so I grew up in New Jersey, uh, knew that I wanted to be a pediatrician when I went to college. So. Um, I went to Lafayette College, and uh, there was, while I was there, there was a guy who had started a research project, and he invited me to be part of this research team. And it was actually looking at bacterial populations in lakes in the Poconos that were stressed by acid rain. And so I had done this, so my first papers are on um, mycorrhiza, which are these little fungal buds that are at the ends of roots of uh, trees. Um, and so I thought microbiology was cool, and that's what got me to Vanderbilt, which is where I did my PhD. I actually went there initially to continue doing bacteriology, but when I was there, I met Tamar Ben Parat, who, um, along with Al Kaplan, her husband, were among the sort of initial people to define the immediate early, early, late stages of herpes virus replication. Specifically, they were working on pseudorabies virus, and it was actually there that I met Lynn, because Lynn, then at DuPont, would come to, <laughs> would come to Vanderbilt uh, to get reagents and to talk with Tamar. And Tamar was a terrific scientist, but she was a little shy and not particularly social. And so it was my job to take the visitor um, out to do fun things. So I would take you to play darts and we'd go get beer and that would be fun. Um, while I was doing the, my, my graduate work, most of the stuff I was doing with pseudorabies virus was in tissue culture, but there was one experiment to look at virulence where we infected mice um, in the foot pad. And what was remarkable was how quickly these animals died of a CNS illness. And very little at that time, this was back in the, I guess, the late 80s, was known about um, uh, neuronal trafficking and virulence, and even in, it, the immune response was still kind of at its early stages. And so I thought this was really interesting and cool. And so I wanted to do my postdoc in something that was more disease connected, disease related, as a consequence actually of that one experiment that I had done with uh, mice and pseudorabies virus. So I did my postdoc at Scripps in San Diego with uh, Michael Oldstone. Uh, I was there for five years worked on CNS infections and immunity. So that was kind of a nice complement to my virology background. And then in 1995, um, I joined the faculty at Fox Chase where Ann was my boss and had been there, <laughs> happily been Did there. Did you hire him? Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes we recruited him. He was a, he was a, he was a keeper. Ah. I, so I wrote a letter of recommendation. Yes. I remember. Look at, so all, all, these connections, all these connections already, and I'll bet there are more. So, yeah, and I've been at the Cancer Center now, amazingly, uh, for 18 years, which is incredible. My oldest daughter was three months old when we moved, and she, I'm taking her off to college in a week. So mm -hmm. I mark time at Fox Chase by looking at Kelsey. I have to say, I looked at your website last night, and you look younger on your website. You know, there's a picture, <laughs> there's a picture of me that um, I have hair, it's not gray, <laughs> I'm thin, uh, but I also look really naive, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether uh, we're better off now than we were then. But yeah, I have to update the picture. So you're the newest member of this authorship team. I am. And we'll probably we'll talk about how that came about in a moment. Lynn, tell us about your history. So uh, I grew up in South Dakota. Uh, <laughs> I bet you don't know many virologists from South Dakota, but there are a few. <laughs> Didn't you say before there are only... There are 77,000 acres in South yeah, Dakota. Yeah, yeah. It's very hard to immunize people yeah. as a result, right? <laughs> and I got my undergraduate degree at South Dakota State University, which is a land-grant agricultural college. And I got my degree in bacteriology, really practical uh, stuff about food and water and sewage and uh, anaerobic bacteria and cow stomachs and things like that. And I got interested in in at that time, which was new stuff, which was uh, using uh, DNA to uh, uh, determine speciation, so DNA hybridization. But this was before we really could do this kind of stuff. And I met a guy named Galen Bradley at an ASM, a local ASM meeting, and he was doing work with Streptomyces using DNA, DNA hybridization in agarose columns. I don't know if you remember that agarose old stuff. columns, oh yeah. Yeah, so you'd immobilize one strand in agarose and then you'd pour a single yeah, strand okay. of DNA over the top, but you had to be careful 
uh, because you could melt the agarose. And the DNAs that I was interested in were in these streptomyces that had GC contents of, that were really very high. And we, I was melting agarose all over the place, couldn't do the experiment. Ah, that's why you work on herpes viruses now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so uh, he, he asked me um, uh, if I would, would, could come to graduate school in his, in his lab. And that was the time of the Vietnam War and whatever, and I had gone into ROTC in, as, a, uh, as an undergraduate at South Dakota State University. And I uh, was commissioned in 1967 as a second lieutenant in the Army. And I told him I couldn't really go. I had to go do my time. And uh, uh, then, amazingly to me, I got a deferment to go to graduate school. The government, in its wisdom, decided that's what I could do. Hmm. And uh, so I went to graduate school uh, with him the first two years at the University of Minnesota. And uh, then he accepted the chairmanship of the Department of Microbiology in Richmond, the Medical College of Virginia. And I had never been really east of the Mississippi other than going to St. Paul uh, in, in, in <laughs> Minneapolis. And so uh, I asked my girlfriend to marry me. And uh, <laughs> we loaded up my Carmen Ghia and we drove across the country and uh, went to Richmond. And I got my PhD there in, uh, in microbiology and uh, a minor in biochemistry and uh, worked on streptomyces. And uh, I was looking for a postdoc and my boss knew a guy named Herb Ennis who worked on, I think, potassium metabolism in E. coli. And he was at the Roche Institute of Molecular Biology. That mm -hmm. He had just gone there. It was just set up brand new. And uh, uh, I thought, oh, this is cool. I want to do genetics, and E. coli is really great. And so I, uh, uh, I went to interview uh, with Herb. But I think the day I went to interview, th somehow I ended up interviewing with their newest young hire, which was Anne. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I was so fascinated with Lambda and the fact that she had just come from Hershey's lab, and he was like my idol. Uh, uh, I was just reading all of this stuff. And so I very happily uh, joined Anne. Uh, I might have been your second postdoc. Second postdoc, yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, the first, <laughs> <laughs> first, first postdoc was kind of an interesting fellow. But anyway, um, she taught me uh, really basic biochemistry, uh, uh, how to work with large DNA molecules. We did lambda replication, recombination. It was really exciting. Uh, and worked with, uh, working with Anne was great. And uh, we had a, had a had a great time. And then, because I got introduced to Lambda and gave a, uh, a good impression of myself at the Cold Spring Harbor meetings, the NIH Lambda group, which was Max Gottesman, Bob Weisberg, uh, 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 asked me uh, to think about doing a second postdoc at at the NIH. And I then I was worried again about the Army because they then had decided they were going to call me up to active duty. And so uh, I got a job offer in the, depart in the lab that uh, Bob Weisberg was in, uh, and uh, uh, Phil Leader was the lab chief. And I told Phil that I couldn't come because I had to go in the Army. He said, well, I can get you transferred to the Public Health Service. And so, <laughs> so I, changed, I got transferred to the Public Health Service and went to the NIH where I did work, more work on bacteriophage lambda stuff, as we talked about before. And uh, uh, I got involved in recombinant DNA technology, and one of the very first things that I had done was cloned herpes virus genes. And there was a little company in Minneapolis that was interested in making uh, animal virus vaccines and vaccines with recombinant DNA technology. And so they convinced me that I should leave a tenured position at the NIH and go and help get an, a recombinant DNA company started in Minneapolis, which I thought would be cool to go back to my roots and whatever. And so after three years, the company essentially was, um, was uh, sold or disbanded or whatever. And I was recruited to go to DuPont, uh, where Phil Leader uh, was uh, an advisor and, and got several of us from my old NIH group, Nat Sternberg and me and uh, Mark Pearson and a few other people to go set up a, a new group at DuPont, which I did. So I was at DuPont for total of about 14 years. Uh, six of them was with DuPont, and uh, the last uh, few years were with DuPont Merck, uh, a pharmaceutical company, a joint venture, where I did far more antiviral drug discovery work and, and whatever. And then Arnie Levine convinced me to go to DuPont, uh, to, to Princeton, and uh, I, that's where I met Jane. <laughs> and uh, I've been at Princeton now for 20 years. So you've done 
so many things. You've done vaccines, antivirals, basic virology research in both industry and academics. And that's why you wrote so many of the chapters in the book, too. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Vaccine right. chapter, antivirals chapter. It's really incredible. Yeah. And now we have Jane Flint, who uh, I s sort of know some of your history, but yeah, you where do. are you from? You're from the UK. I, right? I, I'm from the UK, yes, and I did my um, <coughs> undergraduate degree at the University College in London, which was also really very biochemistry, classical biochemistry based, uh, entirely actually, and probably something I shouldn't have done, I stayed there to do PhD. Um, because actually there was a, a, a new, p relatively new person who'd just come back from doing postdoctoral work here, working on these very large multi-subunit enzymes like fatty acid synthetase, and I sort of got really sucked into trying to think about transcription and the mammalian enzymes that carried out that process, which is what he'd just started to work on. So I actually was his second student, I think. It's sort of one of the traits in my history to be first or second. So I did, again, you know, much more biochemical work there, really focused on um, these enzymes and biochemical characterization, trying to think about how we could assay the, their activities and what were we looking at in the kind of activities that we had. And this was in the first few years of the 1970s, so it's pre-cloning, no genes. And I guess my, you know, big contribution as a graduate student was to show that when we actually assayed RNA polymerase 2 on, you know, genomic DNA made the way that Anne referred to, all we were seeing was rubbish because it just binds to nicks in the DNA and, and does stuff. So it was, you know, the, the, the continuation of the desire to try and think about how transcription worked that made me start to think about DNA viruses because at that time, as I said, we had no genes, we had no promoters. And it was already clear that some of the smaller or moderate DNA viruses like SV40 and certain human adenoviruses, which were you know, among the very few that had been worked on at that time, were transcribed by the host enzymes. And so after sort of contacting various people in both the UK, Europe, and here, the US, I decided I'd come to Cold Spring Harbor, so yet another connection, mm -hmm. as, yes. as a postdoctoral fellow. You didn't overlap with Anne. Oh, no. <laughs> no. I'm sorry, that sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> no, we, we didn't overlap. No, no. No, I think, so, I, I mean, by the time I, I got there, um, Jim Watson was the director, mm -hmm. and I guess he had been for a while, and the lab had really moved <coughs> focus from, for, you know, the... Uh, descendants of the phage group, the original right. phage group, into focusing on small oncogenic viruses. So, in some sense, it was. So, I had a um, you know, big learning experience trying to begin to think about viruses. I guess actually for the first time, um, you know, learned a huge number of techniques because all the things with restriction enzymes, mapping, recombination, we used hybridization extensively too, came in. So it was exciting and um, working with several people, because I didn't really belong to anyone at Cold Spring Harbor for that year. Um, Phil Sharp, Joe Sandbrook, and I developed really the first map of which bits of the adenoviral genome were transcribed. So while it was um, very productive, I also found both the scientific and the um, other life at that place is you know, way out on Long Island. It was relatively isolated, very narrow. So when Phil Sharp moved to MIT, he um, asked you know, whether I'd like to go and continue my postdoctoral fellowship work with him, and I was very happy to do so. And I have to say, um, it was a really great decision, both in broadening my interests and knowledge in viruses, because as Vince knows, um, it was on the so-called fifth floor of the Cancer Center, which has a pretty famous history. Um, Salvaloria was still running the Cancer Institute. He must and I have think hired Phil Sharp, right? Yeah, he hired Phil, right? He hired Phil and David. And, and da well, David had been there for quite a while by then. Yeah. He was well established, this right? This is David Baltimore. We're yes, sorry. Yeah. Yes. And then, so it was in 1974 um, that we, we moved there. Phil and I moved there, and you know, various other people did, and continued really basic molecular analysis, I think, of, of adenovirus. And I, I think I had a really 
educational, fun and productive time at MIT. I just love the intellectual atmosphere there. David Baltimore, this is, was fantastic because I think that whole floor had a really great interaction, even though um, there were floor meeting once a week, incredibly stimulating. And there was still a range of quite a lot of different viruses being studied at that time. So that was really first introduction to you know, a slightly broader view of virology than just the two DNA viruses that people studied at Cold Spring Harbor. And then um, I joined the faculty of Princeton, although it was a very different faculty um, in 1977. It was a very small department at that time. We don't need to go through all that history. <laughs> and I continued, you know, to work on adenovirus, but over the years, my um, interests have really evolved from these very fundamental molecular mechanistic questions to, you know, what goes on between the virus and the host cell? I think that's... So you left uh, MIT in 1977, right? Yeah. And I, so I came two years later. Right. So you were there during the time splicing was sorted out. No, it, right? I, that happened just after I left, actually. So I was there when okay. strong stop was sorted out. Strong I will never forget that. DNA retro and retrovirus, retrovirus yes, yes, right? Yes, And when David right. got the Nobel Prize. Well, that must it have been fun. It was exciting, yes. So yeah. then when you left, the splice, most of the splicing done was work was done in Phil's lab. Yeah, right? and it was done in a really short period. And in fact, it was just after I left, because I know I went back to collect some reagents very early in 1977. <coughs> and I saw some of the first data, which actually never ended up in, mm. you know, Phil's famous paper, which were hybridization data. And, that, and you know, it was still wasn't clear how to think about it. So the other ha part of the Nobel Prize for that discovery splicing went to Rich Roberts, right? Correct. Wasn't he at Cold Spring Harbor? He was at Cold Spring Harbor indeed and, uh, when I was there. And in fact, yeah. the, um, they were getting the reagents together to do, I think probably the most important, I think he, he was recognized for two important experiments from his lab. One is the, the same kind of mapping done by Louise Chow and Tom Broker working with him. And the other was for this experiment done by um, Rich Galenus, mm -hmm. which showed that there was the set of this, we didn't know how many, but there was, we knew there were at least 10 different messenger RNAs made from this um, transcription unit in the adenoviral genome called the major late transcription unit, and they all had the, exactly the same cap sequence. And you could be sure, because it was, I believe it's 13, or is it, no, it's 11. It's 11 nucleotides to the first G. So it wasn't like you were looking at a you know tiny short sequence, mm -hmm. including the cap, and that was another one of those puzzles that was out there that hadn't been explained until splicing was figured out. And that that finding, of course, is in one of the boxes in our textbook. It is indeed. Yeah. Yes. Common oligonucleotide. Right? Mm -hmm. yep, yep. And mm -hmm. so, that so the title of the paper was an amazing sequence. Amazing. That's, that's no, that's that right. was the EM paper. The actually. EM paper. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was unusual for a title back then, right? Oh, it made to have amazing in the yeah. mm -hmm. in the title yeah. of a paper. Yeah. All right, so you can see there are lots of commonalities among, and if we took any six, five science virologists, you'd probably get similar things as well. Because probably not as tight as this bunch. Maybe though. not. Maybe <laughs> not. So let's talk about the virology textbook, the Principles of Virology. It's, it's in its third edition now. We're here to work on the fourth edition, which I think will be out when 2014 is that no no um, 15 it's probably 15 we're aiming for 15 yes. yeah it's due the end of 2014 oh, we have our, to hand it in our due. part is due mm -hmm. all right so let's start at the very beginning i wasn't here for the beginning of this book i think jane you were yes um, tell us how it started yes well i hope <laughs> people will don't worry i'll chip in, chip in <laughs> my memory tends to to sort of be patchy. And Glenn asked questions because you weren't yes, there till yeah. last week. Right? <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> so I mean well, this really I think is an idea that I, I, th I, I think it's fair to say that I was the, p the person who eventually got everyone together. You can have that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. What year was that? Well I, 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 the final group took a while to evolve and I think we'll get to that but I, I guess I started thinking about it. I had in the back of my mind for a long time during my career that I'd like to take on, you know, writing something substantial. I've always really enjoyed writing. I think scientific writing is incredibly important. Um, and I think, you know, once you get more settled in your career and more secure after, you know, the tenure battle or crisis or whatever it, it turns out to be, then those ideas tend to come to the fore. And so it's something I've been thinking about, you know, talking to various people. I 
met on study sections, meetings, you know, seeing what... Most people just weren't interested, right? But then we hooked up with um, Priscilla Schaefer, another herpes virologist, and, and a few others, and began to evolve, you know, possibilities. And the group developed... I don't remember how... Uh, we you you called you called me on the I telephone. I did call you on the phone, and okay. you said we're planning this book, and we need someone who knows about <coughs> retroviruses. retroviruses. Yes. Would you be interested? Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I said, oh yes, because that's thought. I thought that was all I was going to do. Uh, that's this is true. Change. <laughs> <laughs> you were at yeah. Fox Chase at the time. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. But, but living in Princeton. But then. living in Princeton. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Close to you, actually. Yes, very close to my. Right house, around right. the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Which is three minutes from here, I understand. <laughs> yeah, something like are. that. Okay. Yeah, so we, we discussed with um, Anne, Priscilla, myself, uh, some other people, Bob Krug initially, and tried to come up with you know some outlines. And then um, a big issue was um, who would be interested in publishing. And we were really concerned about figure quality and presentation, because I think at least to me, and I think all of us, as we talked about it, it was clear from the start that the graphical presentation was absolutely crucial. Um, I've worked with many texts where no one pays any attention to it, and you can have six different styles on two pages, and you open it and you think, oh, poor students, you know, how are they ever going to get anything out of this? So we talked to various publishers, and in the end, after much back and forth, we sort of set up with ASM Press, who agreed, under certain circumstances, to do full colour. Most, most publishers were absolutely not interested in that at this time, and at the most they would suggest was uh, you know, a set of colour inserts in the middle. And when you look at the book, you can see that it was worth our effort, I think, to go this route. So the, the participa participants evolved, and I think you know, we had a really slow start, absolutely. And it wasn't really till you joined us, Vince, I think, that we began to make really serious progress. Is that how you... No. <laughs> <laughs> right? No. I think uh, another way to think about it was I came in 1993, late 1993 to Princeton. Oh, and Arnie Levine asked me to do a virology course. Yes. And he and I met several times and I said, I have all this experience in different aspects of virology and I've, take, I've looked at textbooks and they're all, I don't like any of them. What textbook would you recommend? He said, you should talk to Jane. She's thinking about one. And uh, uh, I had designed my, the course that I was going to teach based on a book that was called, uh, that was written by Salvador Luria, uh, yeah. General Virology. Right. And I liked the idea that it wasn't about individual viruses, it was about the principles of how different viruses replicate. So I wrote an outline about what I was going to do, and I can't remember why we were at Lahir's at the bar. Yeah. <laughs> but we were sitting at the bar, and you asked me what my course was going to be like, and I told you, and you said... Yeah, write it. Write it. That's a great idea. We should, we should right. really do that. And so, so the very first year, I started thinking about giving my lectures in the context of what, uh, what a course would be. And, and then uh, uh, we, the, the, first, the first group of people that were involved didn't include Vince at, 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 the, at, right. at the start. In the very first edition of the textbook and whatever evolved in a lot of different ways with Anne and, and uh, Jane and me and Bob Krug coming up with it, uh, how we were going to do this, how we were going to put it together and the philosophy of how to write and whatever. And what we ended up with, of course, was, was, was a textbook and that came out in 1999. That was the first edition? That was the first 99? edition, 1999. Yes, but it took us at least oh, it three or four years to really uh, and, and, generate that. Mm -hmm. And it was really... I try the textbook in the context of my own course in which I would take Xerox copies of what, what we had written mm -hmm. and hand it out to the students and have them read, give me advice about uh, back and whatever. So it was really tried in the, in the, uh, in the, in the classroom. And we had a lot, of, a lot of fun. To me, it was one of the more intellectually engaging experiences. I hadn't been around Anne for a long time, and we have a lot of the same concepts about how to do things. And Jane was such a... Uh, a, a stickler for precision in language that I really, really like that. I really like the idea that if you use a word, it should have the same meaning in every context. And I don't know, I think both Jane and, and Anne got me to stop anthropomorphizing 
viruses. <laughs> and, you know, I was trying to make my lectures exciting and talking about viruses doing this and that. And they kept telling me, viruses don't do anything. You can't do that. <laughs> and, and they also, uh, the, uh, I have this sheet, which I, I probably should send to you, Jane. <laughs> it's, a, it's a list of words that I use far more than any other human uh, uses. <laughs> you remember I have, some of them? Yeah. I, oh, you know crucial, uh, key, uh, you know, I mean, sort of adjective, no, interesting, <laughs> you know, just, just so many things that essentially I didn't even know that I was using over yeah. and over yeah. and over and over again. And then the concept of jargon, yes. uh, which we all uh, detested because as a student, you don't, uh, they don't know the history and whatever. And so it was, it was really good. It cleared my, my head up. And then, and then I think the realization that we needed a different perspective on a lot of the RNA viruses is really where where you where you came in. I mean, uh, I think that's right. Have I got that about he was right? On the you were on the first edition. Yeah, I was on the Please first in edition. From the beginning. I don't right. know how long you'd been working. Well, we, when I we came we may on. have been trying to work for a while, but we hadn't got a huge amount. We hadn't gotten a huge. We hadn't uh, gotten all of the chapters done. We had drafts on a number of them, yes. but there were critical exactly. ones that right. that we had to do with count. RNA viruses yeah. that did not get done. Yeah, and we really needed that's some right. help there. That's right. yeah. And that's when you came in, and it was terrific. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's just talk a little bit about this idea of um, writing a book where each chapter is a step in the infectious cycle. Why did you do that? What was the reason, as opposed to writing each chapter a virus, for example? Well, as I told you, uh, that's the way you wanted to teach your course. I had learned virology virus by virus, and I, at that time, I was amazed that most of the virologists that I knew didn't really understand cell biology, mm -hmm. or they, they understood it, but they didn't think of viruses in the context of the cell, and the fact that it's all of the processes are, are sort of the cell's processes, but the virus co-ops them in different ways, and I thought that that was a much better way of seeing the continuity of of of, um, uh, you know, these processes, the, the different viruses have evolved to sample different kinds of things, but the things that are really engaging are cellular processes. And it wasn't that SV40 was the be-all and end-all to tell you everything there was about virology, even though you can teach a whole course on SV40. Uh, and this book by Salvador Luria was the one that yes. really got me. So that was written by principles. Yes, yes. yes. Prin it, is, yes. it is, it is, yes. 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 Yes, calling out the, the, the individual principles that were relevant to all viruses, and that was what we were aiming for. So, you were, and you were okay with this as well, this idea? Oh, yes. Well, oh, yes. I think they're all completely got, on board she, from I think I have her copy of the Luria book, because she's the one who got me interested in this, this concept of, hey, this is not just about one little thing. This is a big deal. Our, what we're studying is a process that's used by lots of things. And so, 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 Jane, did you have this... Idea yes. from the start, yes. or it wasn't yes. that Lind introduced. No, you no, 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 we no, were, no, no. We were yeah. simpatico right mm -hmm. off okay. the bat. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. just yeah. realized this is how we want to do it. So, for the first edition, were there any disagreements in terms of philosophy about how the text was going to be put together? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, some. Yes, there <laughs> yes. was some disagreement. Uh, th there were, as you can hear, um, both Lynn and Jane really had the same idea in the beginning, and of course, I, of course, had that same way of looking at things that is principles. But a lot of uh, virologists don't look at it that way. They really focus in on one virus and want to know every single detail about one virus. And, it, and for s some people, it's really hard to kind of think in this other kind of um, generalized way. And one of our, one of our orig original recruits to the authorship uh, didn't think that way, and so it, it didn't work. It's really very important in a, in an, um, a um, job such as this to have people who at least uh, agree upon how the focus is going to be. If, if that doesn't happen, then, then it's, there's a discordance that, that's not very productive. Right. But I do, I do think that you said something that's very important was that um, uh, our uh, co-authors uh, weren't alone in this. When I went, I went to a Gordon oh, yeah. conference and... Uh, I talked to some of my colleagues about a new virology textbook. They said, oh, great, great, great. What, what are you going to do? And I told them, and they said, oh, that's not going to work. I'm not going to be able to use that. Yeah. You know, I teach it this way. you gotta, you got to write a book that I can use. Right. And, and so that happened a lot. Yeah, it did. And, that, and if you think about it, it's, it's far more challenging to, d thank you, 
far more challenging to try and draw out the principles and for many people I think they're just not interested in doing that and seeing that their favorite virus or, or organism if you talk more broadly actually will tell you much more general principles not only about other viruses and replication strategies or gene expression strategies but about the cell and I think all of us came to virology at least as we heard in the history from thinking more broadly in these cellular molecular pathogenesis context and I think that has a big impact on how we approach this right and, and um, I creation think, uh, we all felt very deeply that this was the, the the best way to teach students because how can you possibly yeah. expect people to get all these remember all these individual differences in in stovepipes when and and it's unnecessary because there are principles that uh, join them all and make make, make it uh, possible to ex to understand all of them. So I'm just wondering, since the text has been around for a while, have you had people who've come up to you to say that they used to teach it virus by virus and then have converted to teaching it more in a principle-based way? Yeah, I've, I've, I've had that, but I've had people uh, ask me, so how do you use your textbook? Because I can't figure out how to put everything together. And huh. I've given them the my outline of my course, and Vince and I both teach teach courses from the textbook, and we have pretty much overlapping ideas of how to, of how to do that. But uh, no, I don't, nobody's really come to me and said, you've, you've opened my eyes to a whole new way of thinking I mean, about there, things. There's certainly a lot of people who love the approach and who yeah. use it. And say thank you for doing it. Yes. I've had emails to that effect. Yeah, yeah. But there are others who tell me to this day, I can't teach this way. I have to do it virus by virus. And so they don't use our book. So there are other books out there that they can use that, that do it that way. But I don't understand that because it, to me it makes most sense. When they first approached me, to do this, it, it, it made total sense that this would no be the brainer. way to teach it. No brainer. <laughs> now, it wasn't easy for some of the chapters to arrange them because I had never written mm -hmm. in this way because you have to learn, if you want to write a chapter on RNA synthesis, you have to learn all the viruses basically and integrate it, so it wasn't easy. So this took a long time to do, but the end product, I think, is, is terrific. Well, and there's something value added about the process, too, in doing it this way, because you get to see commonalities among viruses that are really sure. different in terms of their hosts and pathogenesis, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but who, for example, structurally are really related. So you get to not only appreciate the differences, but also similarities among very different virus families. I have to tell you that if I hadn't written or participated in the writing of this book, I don't think I would have started blogging and podcasting because that gave me the confidence to talk about other viruses. Someone asked me once, why are you writing and talking about other viruses than polio? And I said, well, I, I helped write a textbook. I, I read all about them, and it really gave me yeah. a start. That's so I credit it. I was wondering all. about that. That's it's interesting. interesting. You said that. I was, that occurred to me the other day to wonder if oh, there was absolutely. any impact. So yes. initially I did blogging in 2004 when blogging became easy. And I said, you know, I, wrote, I, I helped write this book. I know all this stuff. I'm going to just start writing about it. And that's how it got started. Yeah. So I, I can tell you, uh, I think one of the reasons I became editor-in-chief of the Journal of Virology for 10 years, mm -hmm. why I was asked to do that, was because I knew a little bit about just about every animal virus that was, that was out there. And people... Yeah. And that's because we wrote this stuff, and I could speak with some confidence, confidence not about details, but about yeah, sort of basic stuff. general yeah. stuff and principles, and I could, could, I could do my job much better. So it really was a big professional positive thing, I think. So the other th uh, topic I wanted to touch on was, does it, did it matter that all of us are in the same area? Was that important initially, or is that just coincidence? So you and Lynn were at the same university. Right. And Anne, Anne was very local. She was um, local. Actually, Priscilla, when we, she was involved, was relatively local. Pennsylvania, Or Krug right. was, yes. It is important. Oh, it was important at the time because of the kinds of meeting we're having now and that we have on regular basis where we actually have to sit face and face. And I think perhaps the crucial point to make to the listeners, you probably don't have a much idea about how we go about doing this, is that we ha each of us have responsibilities for certain topics and we write something that we want to discuss with our colleagues and then the final product, as Glenn is learning during these l last few days, is the result of an awful lot of time spent face to face discussing the ideas, the principles, which details are interesting and really trying to make sure everybody focuses on the principles 
and at the same time pay attention to, to some writing. <coughs> and when the team was put together, it was really difficult to do that any other way. One might argue now that you know we could do multiple Skype. Skype, but I personally don't think we would be able to get the same chemistry and therefore what we all, I think, agree or feel happy about is a, a really good product of that chemistry for students and for people who want to teach virology from this perspective. Just to expand on that, I mean, what Jane is talking about, the process, we, we did it the, f the first time we were went on a retreat to Italy, uh, and, and we couldn't quite figure out how to get our acts together. <laughs> and uh, I don't know who had the idea that, well, why, so you should read, read your writing out loud and see. Someone so. else should read your <laughs> writing yeah. out yes, loud. Yes, yes. 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 That's, and so that's, 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 that's what started. And so uh, the process is not only just to make sure that, you know, the science is good and whatever, yeah, but that, but that there's, a, there's a coherence that uh, when we use this phrase in this context, we use exactly the same, the same phrase. The way I would say that is to say that the text has, we hope, close to one voice rather than five or four separate yeah. voices like many of the compendia type texts that are made. And so the process is really that we read every word in the textbook to each other and it's not what you've written, somebody else reads your, your words. And then we literally hack apart every sentence. If there's jargon in there, we try to figure out what do we really mean when we say pick a plaque? Does anybody know uh, if that that's never done that? Would they know what what it, what it was to pick a recent example? It took us a long time and to expand work that. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> expand it. Yeah. Pick Glenn, a plaque and Glenn, you should it. comment on this since you're the, you're yes. the latest. Yeah, no, so I I knew that you guys spent a lot of time working together, but. I didn't realize that you read every single word. And this is a very big textbook. And actually, so today is Thursday. We've been meeting since Tuesday, and we've read of 24, 25 total chapters, three of them out loud. So this is a really time-consuming process. But it's really, uh, it's fun, and I think it makes for a much stronger text. I mean, beyond just the fact that we weigh each word, that we want to make certain that there isn't jargon, that it's accessible to students, it also actually provokes really interesting conversations mm -hmm. among the five of us, right? So that we spent quite a bit of time even this morning discussing something for 20 minutes, half an hour, about how we represent these, you know, how we discuss these super large viruses, the Mimi viruses and the Pandora viruses, that ultimately is not going to necessarily go into the text, but it was just a good conversation about virology that I think wouldn't have happened if we hadn't gone through the process of reading through the, 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 the book and the legends and the boxes. For, for me, one of the, the, the critical things was that quite often I have in my mind's eye that I understand what I just wrote, and somebody will ask me, what do you mean? And I say, what do you mean, what do I mean? <laughs> yes. This is what I mean. Right. And, and it's clear that there's ambiguities and, and, and whatever, and, and it's, been, it's been really clear. I have to say that I first learned about skill in scientific writing from, from Anne, because when I was a postdoc with her, our very first paper, we went to Cold Spring Harbor, and Al Hershey had read it, mm -hmm. and he's like the consummate editor. I mean, good grief, I never had anybody go over my paper like that. And I think you did that for a reason. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 he did that. So he was grammar, you know, beating around the bush, you poke an idea with a stick, what's the idea, you know, and, and that was... Economy of words. Yes. It was... He never, uh, never wasted a single word, and he never said anything he didn't actually no, it was, it, mean. That was a remarkable experience. And then, mm -hmm. you know, like 20 years later, here I am, sort of, in the same situation, and that was it's very, actually, very powerful. Actually, I pointed out on, on the preface of our book, we actually uh, say right up front what is the philosophy, our philosophy, and it's a quote from Al Hershey, and that's and, and it has to do with, um, uh, and I could read it because yeah, it's a beautiful sure, quote. Read it. The enduring goal of scientific endeavor, as of all human enterprise, I imagine is to achieve an intelligible view of the universe. One of the great discoveries of modern science is that this goal cannot be achieved piecemeal, certainly not by the accumulation of facts. To understand a phenomenon is to understand a category of phenomena, or it is nothing. Understanding is achieved through creative acts. 
and that is our that has been our philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a thing I actually like about the 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 text is the title because I think that factors in here. So it's it's not without thought that it's called principles of virology. I mean, it could have called, been called basics of virology or fundamentals, but you chose principles on purpose because what you're looking for are common themes that are hopefully obvious and, and almost take home messages for students who read the text. So there's a lot of detail in here, but there's also those principles should emerge pretty clearly um, as you work your way through the text. Now, even though it's called principles, there are some viruses that aren't included, and some virologists complain about that. Oh boy. <laughs> right? So, you know, most of the viruses we use are animal viruses, for our examples. We have a few bacteriophages, very little plant, very little plant and plant other virus. So, what do you think about that? So, for me, uh, the very first year that I taught my course, I tried to include all of the viruses that I could lay my hands yeah. on that had principles that I could get across. And it was just a matter of, of economy, uh, of, you know, it, there was, how many different viruses do you want to show, use, that, that use the same principle? And so I ended up, and I think Jane was the first one that, or maybe Anne, said, you know, we should have a cast of characters. These are yeah. the viruses that we're going to use to explain the principles. And if there is something that none of them show, we'll pull another one out and, and do it. The idea was not to highlight you know, a, a particular group or, or whatever. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think I, f I feel badly when I run into my plant virology colleagues <laughs> who tell me that, uh, you know, you haven't, haven't uh, done service there. And the, my phage people f that I've known for years, you know, are, they would like to have a little more phage stuff in there. But again, the point is the principle. Yeah, we can use, yeah. if we could use a phage to teach something that nobody else, no, no other virus group can do, we would do that. So are we missing any principles by not including phage and in plant viruses, do you oh, think? Yeah, some of them. But, you know, like CRISPRs, for example, uh, yeah. you know, which are the sequences that, that cells, the bacteria evolved to defend themselves against viruses. But they, we just can't do everything, you know. CRISPR is like an RNAi in a way. Yeah, yeah, in a way. It's a form yes. of um, and so, right. and so, so yeah, it's not. So it's a derivative, okay. actually. Yeah. So yeah. in fact, yeah. we should mention CRISPRs in this edition and just somewhere mentioning wherever oh, I, we talk I think about it's a, RNAi. I think it's a good idea because it's you know RNAi and and some of these different kinds of cellular defenses uh, against viral infection, um, you know, uh, need to be mentioned. But yeah, it's just that you know you want to keep the book. So that you, you can carry it, it without breaking your back, and yes, yes, the students are the ones that are going to going to use it. So, we had to split it in two, so it wouldn't be too much of a burden yeah. to carry around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it got large. I'd forgotten the cast of characters, so we focused on maybe a dozen. Viruses? Yeah, they were in the appendix. Right, they were in the appendix. And of use the those, and yes, you know, in the first or second edition, there was no hepatitis C virus even because mm -hmm. it wasn't part of the cast of characters. We didn't illustrate any new principles. Although now you might argue that, are we including it now? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. What yeah. It's yeah. Mm -hmm. going to be included. So that is one way that people get frustrated. They can't find their favorite virus. Yeah. You know? yeah. Mm -hmm. Where, but there are other books for that. There are encyclopedias where you can look up your virus and get yeah. facts on yeah. it. Yeah. Right? I just don't want to lose track of the idea that uh, this is to teach students, students yes. about virology yeah. and not teach students about viruses. viruses. Yes. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, one thing that's very striking during our conversation here, so we're here as we've told you to read chapters and discuss others and often during the reading someone will say how would a student interpret this? Is this clear to a student? Because that's really the ultimate mm -hmm. goal, right? Yes, to it make is. Sure that it's clear to them. And I, I just want to emphasize this reading part. I don't think anyone does this with any other book, read it aloud. Um, w it takes a long time, and it's amazing. There are, there, there are chapters that have words from the first edition, and we will still find things wrong with it here at the yeah. fourth reading. Yes. Yes. What did we mean by this? Why is this paragraph here? It makes no sense, and it's been in the book for three editions. <laughs> And I think if you don't read it, you wouldn't pick up any of that. The, the, I, that's absolutely true. And I think all of us mm -hmm. also find that we think, as Lynn said, we've got things either clear in our heads or clear on paper. Yeah, and then when you read it to yourself, you don't see it. 
That's and right. you have to have it brought into this, what is this different kind of consciousness when you hear it? Yes. You've got to process it. Yes. So you see things that you, know, you, you just would not just from sitting and reading it. So it's also worth mentioning that this book doesn't have an author per every chapter, really. In a right. lot of textbooks, each chapter is written by an author and the name is at the front of the chapter. We don't do that. We right. just have our names on the front because it's a, it's a collective, connected work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So one of the fun things I like is when Jane discovers words that you don't <laughs> like. There's, and we have a list of some words. And I have, I you have some down. of them there, Vince? I wrote one down the other day. Well, I, I wrote some things that are, uh, uh, you know, people use all the time. And, uh, and that actually has come up in this yes. reading. We've had <laughs> proteins being expressed. Right. You don't that, like that. Well, it's not possible, is it? <laughs> Many people... <laughs> I write know, that you in see it in almost all the papers that you open Proteins and read these expressed. days, and, and you see students doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know how terrified I'm going to be when you read my chapters? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a le it's a learning experience. Holy <laughs> cow, I'm sure I'm going to have proteins doing all kinds of things. Proteins can do many things, they just cannot be expressed. <laughs> They can't be mutated either. This no. Is true. Oh, that's my pet peeve. Yes. Right. You, yes. Oh, oh, I, I can't remember the stand time, it. I remember the time woman, right? when you brought, I would think it was on my chapter, you started yelling at, <laughs> you can't do this, the mutation is in a nucleic acid. Yes. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I've been using this for years. Oh, yes. 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 That's you that that proteins, it drives me crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have a little text box that says uh, mutations are on nucleic acids, that's right? That's correct, exactly. The other thing is transfection, of course, which is totally misused. Yeah, but that's, no. a, that's a lost battle, I uh, have it's to say. Totally. I, I've gone. transfected it's this lost. into yes. that cell. Yeah. Oh. It's really... But there are, s there are just sim single words, like interesting is one of them. We don't really want to have interesting in it. We want to say why something is interesting, correct. Not, not just, just say interestingly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there are a whole host of others. Which I, you remember any? Can, can you think of any of the words that are banned? Well, you'll learn. Yes, you'll learn. Factor, factor a little yellow protein. sticky with it. With ah, uh, yes, factor, using factor. Because yeah. if you know what it is, say what it exactly. is. Right. Exactly, exactly. I'm happy to see that you don't use the phrase play a role very often, because that bothers me <laughs> uh, a, a lot. Yeah. Since you said that, I've been sort of thinking it's more common than it should be, but I, <laughs> so it depends, you know, often you can avoid it for, for some things. It's like everything, I suppose. If you spend enough time, you can find a but better I think, alternative. I think uh, all this sounds uh, you know, sort of Baroque in a way, but the whole idea is to be precise. Yes, absolutely. And not only precise, yes. you have to be accurate. So you have to describe a process using words that mean precisely what, what they should mean. Not, and and uh, getting my writing to be like that was hard work, I have to say. Because throughout the book, you want one word to mean the same thing the same everywhere. Thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's really And important. I think it's interesting because we all had things that we really had to address. And as Lynn will remember, I used to write in A sentences that, you know, like, yeah. sorry, just not Jane, a paragraph, Jane but very like, long. Like I don't James anymore. Joyce. Right, no, not as long as Joyce. Oh, you <laughs> said something the other day. You yeah. said something the other day that Princeton students like, which compares <laughs> Hemingway, Hemingway, Hemingway to James Joyce. Yeah, that's so what my, 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 my advice is please, please write like Hemingway, not right. like James <laughs> Joyce. Right. I like right. simple, you know, and direct, uh, direct sentences. The, and I, the, I the, try to avoid the passive voice yes. as much as possible. It's so easy to fall into these, these habits. And, and when you're trying to get a book that not only teaches principles but it also should be it has readable to be accessible. it has yeah. to be accessible interesting it has to be interesting it has to be <laughs> accurate um, I, I, th that was a real challenge the other the other thing i think we've avoided is using abbreviations oh if acronyms you, if, yes. uh, acronyms oh. you if you take a, 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 a pick Any up paper. a journal mm -hmm. and you start reading it if I, oh, the alphabet soup there and that i think can be just totally discouraging to students so we've avoided that completely, and it makes for long writing out, but I think it makes for intelligent reading because otherwise it's, it's hopeless. That and uh, also having um, designed some conventions for how to write things out, how, how, do, we, how do we write the names of the so-called factor proteins and, um, and, and uh, how we designate different symbols like DNA is blue, with different strands and different colors. And all of these things, I think, really took careful thinking through. And they're all meant to help the student uh, read in an, uh, in an easy way. 
And all of this wouldn't be possible in a multi-authored book when you have every chapter written by a different author and there's no continuity like this. That's Everyone correct. writes in their own way and, mm -hmm. and I think that this is, makes it a better learning experience for students. And in the me your mentioning of the artwork brought that up in my mind. We should talk a little bit about how we've been lucky to work with a good artist. Yes, absolutely. Who's yeah. done all of the, is that true? So Patrick Lane and Patrick, Associates has done all he, of the, the books? He, the actually, the first outfit were called John Woolsey and Patrick worked for worked them, them and then went on his own so we stayed with him. And in my, in my view he is someone who's not only a good artist but understands biology. Yeah. Yes. You yes. can tell him something and he gets it. Yeah. yeah. I mean it's one thing to make a pen a pen and pencil drawing or a comp you're your best at yeah. you know Photoshop or Illustrator or whatever and he can take that and turn it into real uh, something that more accurately represents what you're trying to say. That's a real gift. Uh, I have to say. And mm -hmm. we have sessions where we, we make drafts of what we'd like a figure to be. And mm -hmm. We sit down with him and, s and we explain it to them. He takes notes and then he comes back with a computer produced draft and we go through a few iterations, right? Yes. And I think everyone will agree the artwork in, in this book is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it's really part of what makes it great. And uh, the thing I didn't realize is that it's consistent from figure to figure. So DNA is always the same color, mm -hmm. RNA is the same color, and that's maintained are all the way. The same. Yep, the same. upside down. Upside down. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have a key. I still have it. Uh, I was going to actually. I think one of the changes yes. we're going to do for the fourth edition is to actually include the key so that yes. the readers of the yes. text can actually mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. yes. how that's carried through yeah. each of yes. the figures. Mm -hmm. Bo boxes are color keyed, and now thanks to you, Glenn, we're going to have little. Uh, boxes that, in, that will include the principles for each tra chapter to be helpful to the students. So I think that's a good addition as well. So, Glenn, why did you decide to do this? Well, you asked me. <laughs> you okay. asked me, Vincent, actually. Well, everyone asked you. I just wrote the email. That's all. Um, so I, th I guess it may be from a couple of reasons. One is I, I love this field. So, I mean, I, I think there is um, so much richness in virology and it touches so many other disciplines, right? So part of it was that being able to participate in a textbook was going to benefit me because I was going to get to learn about a lot of things that I don't know much about. In fact, you know, yesterday we, we read through the structure chapter and I was finding I was learning all kinds of things because that's very different from what my lab does. Most of my chapters are related to the um, host response and immunology chapters. Um, but I think also part of it was, uh, uh, um, without sounding too soapy about it, it's a little bit of a way of, of giving back. At the Cancer Center, a, a place I'd love to be, but we don't have graduate students unless we get them from other area institutions. So unlike you, Vincent, or Lynn, or Jane, I don't, we, Anne and I don't teach. So this is a way of um, um, being able to translate some of the enthusiasm about the field and put it into a textbook that's going to be of, of broad interest. So it, um, you know, it was a little self-serving to be part of it because now I get to learn stuff and have that same kind of now, you know, encyclopedic or breadth of, of, of the field, but also because I feel like this is uh, an important service to our community. So I think one last thing we should touch on and what, what's going to be different about this new edition. Oh, yeah, right. Well, I guess the most important thing that's going to be different is that it will be electronic, which we think offers incredible opportunities both for um, presenting experimental results. For example, you know, so many of the experiments that are performed these days are look at dynamics and one can just direct the students to those um, videos. But also it will allow us to, I think, give a much more What's the word? Um, immediacy? Yeah, immediacy, even just going through the... Um, you well, know. Maybe you can be, if in the steps of a, of uh, a cycle, you exactly. can do one step at a time. That's what I clearer, mean, yes. Yeah. yeah, you can really get the dynamics of um, what some of the things we're trying to convey uh, in, a, in a very direct way. So that's one huge... Um, and interviews uh, with people who have yes. made important discoveries. Mm. I think that'll be lots of fun for the students to see... Yeah real human beings behind these experiments. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I think that's, and, and um, interactive figures, where yes. you can have a figure and you can query it for a particular piece of information, and, but see the whole thing uh, all at once.
I think those will all be uh, wonderful advantages. And we, we still are printing in, in addition. Do we know yet? We're not sure. I believe we are. But, but I think there are people out there yes. that would I think probably I, I'm still I'm sure want. we will pr print yes. something, yes. yes. Or ASM Press will print, print it. Print something, yeah. We won't. Is there, is there anything else that we should discuss or bring up or tell everyone about how this book works? Uh, just two other small changes, I think, to the fourth edition. One, as Anne already pointed out, is as we're reading through the chapters, we're trying to cull out those overarching principles. So those are going to go right up front in uh, their own dedicated box so that, you know, because there's a lot of detail in, in here, and it may in some cases, depending upon who's teaching the course or what the student wants to get from the text, it may be overwhelming. So we felt like providing a little bit of, you know, here are the big take-home messages for each chapter would be useful in that context. So that's one thing we're doing. And we've also talked about the idea of engaging students to read some of our chapters um, in, in advance. Form, yeah. In, as drafts and give us comments as to whether are we on track, are we getting it about right, is this way too detailed, is this way too basic, um, is it just completely inaccessible because you know ultimately this is this is not an exercise for the five of us, this is for the students and if they respond back to us and say wow that was really hard for me to understand then I think we have more work to do so by incorporating them as reviewers in addition to our peers was going to make the text stronger as well. You know, we did that in the first edition. Mm -hmm. I took from my, my course, mm -hmm. and it was eye-opening to have the students say, I had no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> and we had thought that was so clear. Or the yeah. order of presentation. So yes. it's really valuable to do that. Right. We have a lot of people that read, our, uh, the, the read drafts for us, that's for sure. And I should say to our listeners, who are many, if you use the book and you have any problems or you want something added, let us know. Send us an email. You can... Send it to twiv at twiv.tv, and we'll uh, see what we can do, right? Yeah. Because I'm sure a lot of our listeners are, are also readers of the textbook. In fact, yesterday I took a picture of you guys and put it on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash thisweekinvirology, and immediately someone, I said we're rewriting the textbook, and someone said, please make an e-book, please, please, please. <laughs> I can't carry it around anymore. <laughs> so it's coming. We'll get that as well. All right, this episode of TWIV will be at twiv.tv and also on iTunes. And if you like what we do, one way you can help us is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe and leave a comment or a rating. And that helps to keep uh, the podcast visible on Apple's crowded uh, podcast pages because we want everyone to learn about the great stories in virology out there. Uh, as I said, you can send your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. From Princeton University, Jane Flint and Lynn Enquist, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and from the Fox Chase Cancer Center, Ann Scalka, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And Glenn Raw. You're welcome. Thank you for doing this and for coming back again. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>